Now, just a little background for those of you who may not uh, have been uh, with us in the previous series, which looked at the, the 18th century, a little background about what was taking place in that century around uh, Cooper and the environment in which Cooper uh, exercised uh, his ministry of writing hymns and poetry. And the 18th century is a remarkable one. It begins with a Britain uh, in which the Archbishop of Canterbury is complaining that things had never been so low in a Christian country as they were in the 1730s and early 1740s. A Britain in which the aristocracy generally lived for pleasure, in which uh, both from the, the Prime Minister at the time, uh, Robert Walpole, and the early kings of the Hanoverian dynasty, George I and George II, uh, one saw a lifestyle of uh, uh, immorality and sexual license and drunkenness. And not surprisingly, significant portions of the population of England follow suit. But by the end of the 19th century, there had been, or end of the 18th century rather, there had been radical changes take place in Brit British society. From a people who had little interest largely in the gospel, there had been planted throughout England uh, large communities of God-fearing, Bible-loving uh, people, many of them called Methodists. One thinks of the Wesleys, uh, whom God raises up in the late 1730s and early 1740s at great personal cost and hardship, who rode throughout England with the message of the gospel that had, in many pulpits, been lost. As you look at the, the Anglican Church, the state church, in the 1720s through the 1740s, one has to admit uh, that the gospel had been largely obscured that many of those who filled those pulpits were men who were simply passing uh, the, time, the time of day to, to secure time and money to do other pursuits rather than the care of the various flocks and shepherding of the people of God who were entrusted to their care. Uh, in London, for instance, when William Remain, an evangelical minister, goes there in the 17, uh, late 1740s, early 1750s, he knew of no other evangelical minister in the Church of England in the entire city of London, the largest city in the world, the city probably close to a million people at that day. By the end of Romaine's life, where he had lived a long life, by the time he came to, to die in the 1790s, he knew of probably two or three hundred at least in London alone uh, evangelical ministers. And so there was remarkable changes. And William Cooper's life is part and parcel of this evangelical revival. And he becomes one of the great hymn, hymn writers of that revival. He was born in 1731. He was born amid what one writer has described as great expectations. He came from a family of wealth and position and power. Uh, the Coopers were a great family. One of the Lower uh, the upper gentry. They were not necessarily aristocracy, all of them, but they 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 touched the fringe of the the upper middle class and the and the upper class itself. Um, the family on whose estates he was born had about ten thousand acres in the heart of Hertfordshire, one of the home counties around the city of London. His father was a rector. Uh, the Reverend John Cooper, who was one of the chaplains to George II. His grandfather, you don't need to necessarily get all the, the, the details, just to get the larger picture of, of the background in which he came. His grandfather was Spencer Cooper, who had been in his t day a judge, a member of parliament, and a fairly important figure in the political system of England in the mid-18th century. Spencer's brother, after whom William was named, was William uh, Cooper, who also was known as Earl Cooper. He uh, was an earl, uh, made an earl for uh, some of his political um, responsibilities. And so law and politics were very much part of the lifeblood of his father's family. His, uh, on, the, on his father's side, politics uh, many of them involved in politics and many of them involved in law. Not be surprising uh, 
that his father expected his son to follow in the footsteps of his uh, forebears and become a lawyer or become involved in politics. But William was also born into a, a very artistic family. His mother uh, was a, a, a devotee of poetry of the day. She, her maiden name was Anne Dawn, D-O-N-N-E, and some of you may know the great uh, 17th century poet John Donne. And uh, there, she was distantly related to the, this great poet of the 17th century. And a number of um, <coughs> William Cooper's uh, family were poets. Ashley Cooper, he'll come into our story in a minute. He's an uncle. Um, he made for, a name for himself as a poet. Uh, one of um, Cooper's uh, cousins, Martin Madan, M-A-D-A-N, a great evangelical preacher of the day, a man who had quite a ministry after his conversion under John Wesley, uh, whose ministry was ruined in the 1770s when he printed a book uh, defending polygamy. And we won't go into <laughs> uh, the reasons as to why he defended it, but he defended, argued that polygamy was a solution to the widespread prostitution in London. Uh, he recommended that uh, many of these women could be married off in multiple numbers to men. And uh, not surprisingly, the book ruined his ministry. Um, but he was a, a famous a poet. In fact, there is in our hymnals, there is sometimes a, a hymn that is sometimes ascribed uh, to Martin Madame. Uh, Maria Cooper, also an evangelical, another um, uh, cousin of William Cooper, also was a, a fairly well-known hymn writer in her day. And she was well known for her bo a book, Original Poems on Various Occasions. And so, uh, Cooper is born into a family which has on the one side law and politics. His father will expect him to go into law, and we'll see what comes of that. But on the other side, there is flowing through the veins of many of his family this uh, interest in uh, literary subjects, poetry, and so on. And it is that that will come out in William's life. His mother had seven. His mother and father had seven children. Only two would survive infancy. Not untypical of the period we're looking at. Uh, William, and then born six years later, was John. And within a few weeks of John's birth, his mother died. It was the first of a number of shocks uh, to William's system that he really never overcame. In some respects, uh, uh, down to his dying day, William retained very vivid memories of his mother, even though he was only six when, he died, when, she, when, he, when she died. He could say many years later, I can truly say not a week passes, perhaps with equal veracity, I might say not a day, in which I do not think of her as his mother. Such was the impression her tenderness made upon me, though the opportunity she had for showing it was so short. His father, who seems to have been a little unfeeling as to his son's experiences after the death of his mother, packed him off pretty quickly to a boarding school. He's got two sons. One is uh, only a few weeks old when his, the mother dies, and he has to take care of him with a wet nurse. The other son, whom he presumably doesn't really want around, is packed off to a boarding school. And uh, not untypical of the upper class in England at that time and some of the upper middle class was the system of sending sons uh, to boarding schools at a very young age. And so William was sent to a boarding school, a place called the Old Vicarage, in which his, the headmaster was a man named William Pittman, who was a classical scholar. And it was here in these early years of his primary school education that a love for poetry was, was sown because this man uh, took his students through um, uh, some of the classical poetry obviously being read in translation. He emerged from uh, his primary school with a love of poetry and also because his, uh, the headmaster being a classical scholar, there, those languages had, the rudiments of them had begun to be taught to him. And so he emerged with a beginning of a, what would become a commanding knowledge of Greek, Latin, French, and Italian. 
Uh, it's a very different period of education. Uh, the sciences were not primary in the educational curriculum. What was primary were languages and classical studies. And so it's not surprising he had a number of these languages. He began to get them under his belt, so to speak, when he emerged from his primary school education. Now, the tradition of the family was that uh, he would be sent to Westminster School for his secondary education, that is, education in his early and mid-teens. And so it was, he was sent to Westminster School, where there were about 350 other boys. Typical boarding school. In those days, Westminster was regarded as, a, as the finest boarding school for young men in England, much even finer than one that we know the name probably well today, Eton. And uh, it was designed for those who would be in positions of, of importance, of power and influence in British English society when they had come to adulthood. But his experience there was an interesting one, to say the least. Most of the, the teachers there were not good teachers. When they turned up to class, uh, their teaching, if they turned up to class, uh, Cooper remembers many occasions when the teachers didn't come to class, or if they did come, they might be drunk. But if they, when they turned up to class, the teaching was of not a good quality. And so it was that William and a group of other students began to teach themselves. And it was here that he developed a great interest in some of the classical poets of the ancient world, in particular Homer. And he began reading Homer in the original Greek, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Many years later, uh, in his last probably ten years of his life, he will spend writing a translation of the Iliad and the Odyssey, which will be published in the 1790s. And his, his lifelong love of poetry of the ancient world is sown in his uh, experience at Westminster. Some of the other characteristics that uh, Cooper would have later in life are also evident here. His love of writing. Uh, Cooper's letters are a, an education in themselves. If you ever have opportunity to read some of his letters, he, his letters would become very well known in the 19th century as an example of how to, to write a letter so that it not only informs but educates. Um, his interest in pets. Uh, Newton, uh, rather Cooper, had a great dislike of the barbarity of many aspects of English society in the 18th century. Uh, bull baiting and bear baiting were still common practices, although dying out. Um, practices where one would put in a pit a, a bull or a, or a bear and tied to a stake and then men would bet on their dogs as to how, uh, which dog would be able to eventually kill the bear or the bull. Um, uh, fox hunting was a major pastime among the aristocracy. And uh, Cooper, who grew up in this aristocratic environment, developed very early on a deep dislike for the treatment of animals by the English upper class. And he has a number of poems in which he's very critical of the way in which uh, the English upper class were cruel to animals. Um, he had, in his time at Westminster School, he had a pet mouse that he smuggled into his room. Not supposed to have pets in his room, but he smuggled it in and kept it in a drawer. Uh, later in life, he would have a pet hare, which he kept. And he's got a, he's got a poem uh, called The Hare. And so many of the characteristics that would be part of Cooper's life begin to emerge during his time at Westminster. Now, by the time that he graduates in uh, 1749, and he now has to make his way in the world, his father was convinced that he was a budding lawyer. His father was completely, utterly mistaken. Cooper would later write of his father's intent. My father, he wrote, intended to beget a chancellor, a chancellor of the university. He'd have to be a lawyer first, and then go on to become a chancellor. Instead, he begat a translator of Homer. It's impossible for the effect to differ more from the intention. He became articled. He, there are a number of, there were four law courts in London with names like the Inner Temple, the Middle Temple, uh, Gray's Inn, and Lincoln's Inn. 
And you started in uh, one of these, as it turns out, he started in the Middle Temple, and he was articled as a clerk to a solicitor in London, and then he would work his way up, so eventually he would be called to the bar and become a solicitor or lawyer himself. And um, he was a lazy lawyer. He admits this many years later. He's, remember, he's, it's important to recognize he is not a Christian during this period of time. He never used his time properly, wasted his talents, had really no interest in law. He, fi- he found himself pushed by his father into a profession that did not a- a- attract his interest at all. The, back- the real essence of his life was a group of men that he hung out with, if I can use contemporary jargon, uh, in London who called themselves the Nonsense Club. And these were a number of men, some of whom he would re- later recognize as ne'er-do-wells, men who had enough money to live a kind of rakish life, not bothering where their, their income came from because their parents had left them significant money or put a significant money away for them to live on. And uh, they would meet each Thursday night where they'd drink and uh, eat uh, dinner together and share their literary concerns. And this was the heart, really. This is what co- made Cooper... So on the one hand, you've got him during the day, plunged into the world of law, despising it. And also really, from his constitution, unable, as we will see, to cope with the demands a public life demanded. On the other hand, this kind of second life of his, this, this group of men, the nonsense club, also being the main focus of his interests. It's during this period of time, in the 1750s, he falls in love. Having been raised in an all-male environment at these boarding schools, he had had little time to get acquainted with uh, the opposite sex. And so it is that he's now suddenly out in the world and he has opportunity. He falls in love with his cousin. And... uh, is, this is the daughter of the uncle I mentioned earlier, Ashley Cooper, who was a poet. And Ashley Cooper had three daughters. Harriet, who would become known as Lady Hesketh. She would marry uh, a man who had some title. And she would, she would play, and I'm not going to go into it, she would play an important part in uh, Cooper's later life. She would become his literary executor uh, when he experiences deep, Bouts of depression and most writers will agree times of insanity and she would become his literary executor she never liked his evangelicalism and actually destroyed uh, parts of his literary heritage to prevent it being seen how evangelical a man he was so there was Harriet that's the older sister there was a younger sister the younger sister was called Elizabeth But it was a middle sister, Theodora, whom young William fell in love with. She would die about 24 years after uh, William. She died when she was 90. Um, He would die, as uh, I haven't mentioned, in 1800. She appears to have loved him. And both of them appear to have made plans to get married. But actually, uh, Theodora's father refused to allow them to get married. He gave his, his ostensible reason, uh, uh, two reasons. One is, first of all, they were cousins. And as cousins, he felt they shouldn't get married. Uh, cousins in that day, and since that day, have gotten married. And I'm not sure how uh, uh, strong a reason this was from his point of view. More important from his point of view was he was convinced William didn't have any money. He was right. William didn't have any money. And he observed closely that William didn't have really much skill in being a lawyer, and therefore he configured that William was never going to make a lot of money, and his daughter had been used to significant wealth. And he didn't want his daughter marrying a man who, as far as he was concerned, would end up a pauper. The real reason was probably... Ashley's wise realization that on both sides of the family there ran a history of mental illness. And he was fearful lest any children they had would be uh, mentally insane. 
actually himself wrestled with deep depression, sometimes for weeks on end, and he'd shut himself up in his study. And uh, when he didn't shut himself up in his study, people said he was a very odd character in some of his actions. William Cooper himself, at this period of time, was going through a period of depression. And uh, Theodora also showed signs of being mentally unbalanced at times. Cooper, though, would take it very difficult. This was the second major shock to his system. The first was the death of his mother. The second would be the frustration of his love, as it were, for Theodora. He wrote a poem in 1754. It is important to note that even at the, sometimes in the depths of despair that Cooper would be plunged, even at times when we would describe him as insane, he was still able to write powerful, powerful poetry. Here is a, the poem he wrote in 1754 when he was forced to part with Theodora. He called her De Delia, D-E-L-I-A. The heart of a lover is never at rest with joy overwhelmed or the sorrow oppressed. When Delia is near, all is ecstasy then. And I even forget I must lose her again. When absent, as wretched as happy before, despairing I cry, I shall see her no more. He, once he was parted from her, he never saw her again in uh, this world. And uh, neither of them, it would appear, recovered de uh, from the shock in some respects. She never married, uh, vowing that she had loved only uh, William and could never love another. And uh, she stayed true to that love uh, for him. Many, many years later, when he found himself in poverty and trying to live like a gentleman, a man who had been raised to uh, kind of a, a, in a, uh, an hour, some, uh, a middle, upper middle class home, but he didn't have the resources to live that way, and he was really in poverty, he began to receive anonymous gifts of money. He never found out who his benefactor was. It turned out to be a benefactress. It was none other than Theodora, who regularly sent anonymous gifts of money to him until he died in 1800. She would not die until 1824. Now, nothing influenced William Cooper's poetry more than his faith. And thus his conversion plays a major role in all that subsequently came from his pen. And we need to take some time in looking at his conversion. Fortunately for us, Cooper has left us a fairly detailed written account of it in a, in a, a document called The Memoir, which thankfully was in other hands than Harry, uh, Harriet Hesketh's. If she had gotten her hands on it, she would have destroyed it. And which he records how God brought him to a saving knowledge of himself. The breaking of the relationship with Theodora certainly was a key aspect that God used on the road to Cooper's conversion. That took place in around 1754-1755. Two years later, his best friend, a man named Sir William Russell, was drowned. And that was another shock to his system. He wrote these words on Russell's death. Doomed as I am in solitude to waste the present moments and regret the past, deprived of every joy I valued most, my friend torn from me and my mistress lost. He's thinking here about Theodora. See me neglected on the world's rude coast, each dear companion of my voyage lost. Nor ask why clouds of sorrow shade my brow and ready tears wait only leave to flow. Why all that soothes a heart from anguish free, all that delights the happy, palls with me. Between 1757 and 1763, when a Cooper does experience an evangelical conversion, you, if the, the poetry that he's left and the writings that he's left, some of the letters that date from this period, indicate an increasing sense of despair, an increasing sense of conviction of sin, an increasing sense of his own worthlessness. He sank lower and lower in spirits. The last straw comes in 1763. He was to, be take, he was to take a very important uh, job in the House of Lords. 
and there was a public examination that was part of the position. His whole family was, was banking that he would be able to, to successfully make this uh, examination and repay all of the effort that they had done into encouraging, well, sending him initially to Westminster, uh, uh, the, the prime school for secondary uh, school in England, and then providing for uh, his, his training uh, in law at the inner, at the middle and then the inner temple. But Cooper was, or Cooper was a very shy person. And the idea of having to go through a, a public examination in law for a number of hours drove him to despair. He was convinced he couldn't pass the tests. And he would utterly uh, uh, d dismay his family. He felt he only had one alternative, which was suicide. He purchased, and he tried, as we will see, killing himself in three ways. He purchased a large, uh, what he thought was a sufficient quantity of laudanum, which is a liquid form of opium. He downed it, but it didn't do the job. Finding himself still living, he then took a knife and tried to pierce his chest with it. But again, he failed to kill himself that way. Finally, he figured he'd, he'd hang himself and took his garter and hung himself up to one of the rafters on the, uh, in, his, in the room in which he was in. He awoke to find himself still alive. His maid had discovered him. The garter, uh, the belt had broken and he had collapsed to the floor. By this time, he was almost what we would describe as insane. His family, uh, realizing the the, the, the strain he had been under, the fact that he, he had been pushed to the, this length of trying to kill himself, committed him to an insane asylum. One gets the sense, before we look at who was running that and what God did with him there, we get a sense of his feeling of remorse about what he had tried to do in this poem, lines written during a period of insanity. It's a fa as I say, it's fascinating that he could write rich, deep poetry in the midst of a dreadful despair. The second verse of this poem goes like this. And he's talking about what he feels, how God feels about him. Damned below Judas, more abhorred than he was, who for a few pence sold his holy master, twice betrayed Jesus me. In other words, he's, he's convinced that the crime that he had done was far worse than Judas's, and that he would be damned for it. And then again, this is the final, this is the way the poem ha ends. Him, that is Judas, the vindictive rod of angry justice sent quick and howling to the center, that is hell, headlong. I fed with judgment in a fleshly tomb and buried above ground. And this is poetry. Uh, Cooper excelled in what we call free verse. And I spent this much time going through this because you need to get a glimpse of where Cooper was and what God does for him. And how Cooper, there is a constitutional problem that Cooper will wrestle with all of his life. And he does illustrate for us that some Christians, those even after conversion, wrestle sometimes with nervous or fearful constitutions that things are not always made as it were perfect after conversion thankfully William was put in a, in a, in a, in a, a place where those who were insane were that was run by a Christian a man named Nathaniel Cotton who was a friend of another great hymn writer of the 18th century Philip Doddridge and Cotton began to try to care for him and share the gospel with him. In the early days when um, Cooper was there, all he would do was walk around the ground saying this, I'm damned, I'm damned, I'm damned. He was convinced that his attempt to commit suicide had put himself, had put him outside the pale of God's mercy. One day, however, Cooper found a Bible lying on a garden, garden bench. And he opened it and began to read 
of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. He began to become hopeful. And he says that he saw so much benevolence and mercy and goodness and sympathy in Christ's dealing with Lazarus and with Lazarus' family. He began to hope maybe there was hope for him. It was a few weeks later he was reading the scriptures. Nathaniel Cotton has got him reading the word of God. He reads this verse from Romans 3, verse 25. I'm talking about Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. A passage that speaks richly about how through faith in Christ, and Christ as the the substitution for sinners, for all of their sins, that a man or a woman can enter into peace with God. Cooper had said, would say, upon reading this, immediately I received strength to believe, and the full beams of the Son of Righteousness shone upon me. I saw the sufficiency of the atonement he had made, my pardon sealed in his blood, and all the fullness and completeness of his justification. In a moment I believed and receive the gospel. He would stay up another year in Nathaniel Cotton's care. Um, basically, he has a sufficient sense to realize that he needs to grow stronger mentally before he can go back out into the world, as it were. But he's been converted. A number of years later, he would write this poem and it's part of a group of poems we're going to look at in the second hour called the Only Hymns. It's based on Revelation 21.5. Behold, I make all things new. How blessed thy creature is, O God, when with a single eye he views the luster of thy word, the day spring from on high. Through all the storms that veil the skies and frown on earthly things, the sun of righteousness he eyes with healing on his wings. Struck by that light, the human heart, a barren soil no more, sends the sweet smell of grace abroad, where serpents lurked before. The soul, a dreary province once, of Satan's dark domain, feels a new empire formed within, and owns a heavenly reign. The glorious orb, and he's thinking about the sun, whose golden beams the fruitful year control, since first obedient to thy word, has started, he started from the goal, has cheered the nations with the joys his orient rays impart. But Jesus, tis thy light alone, can shine upon the heart. And we see here in this, what would some would regard as a hymn, but probably is more uh, better described as a poem, his description of what God had done for him. He'd taken him from a position where he had been in Satan's dark domain, where he had felt that his heart was barren that serpents looked there there, and God had shined upon him and now he was filled with God's grace and Jesus had shone upon his heart about four years after this um, between 1763 that's a place in 1763 his conversion between 1763 and 1767 he was led by God to live with a family called the Unwins. And uh, the father was a minister of the gospel, an evangelical man. And he received much spiritual care living in this household. In 1767, though, uh, Reverend Unwin died suddenly. And uh, Cooper would decide to live on with the family uh, the, the woman, whose name was Mary Umwin, uh, was about 10, 12 years older than he, and the son was a man named William Unwin, who was a very close friend of Cooper's. In 1767, the family met John Newton and would move to a place called Olney. And let me say a little bit about Newton uh, so you understand something of the, the quite the dramatic background, <coughs> the dramatic contrast, rather, between Newton and Cooper. Cooper is and would remain all of his life a shy individual. A man who wrestled (coughs) with a delicate, really a delicate constitution to some degree. Newton is the complete opposite. A man who 
was a very powerful man physically. A man who had been raised in a godly home, but again whose mother had died young, and whose father had uh, encouraged to go to sea when he was about 12. And he'd, be, he'd worked his way up through the ranks of, uh, of merchant marine ships in, uh, in the Navy. He spent some time on a British ma- uh, man of war, a warship, but then had been able to escape from that and uh, spent most of his life on merchant ships. He'd become a slave trader. <clears throat> he'd been a participant in that horrible uh, slave trade where ships would leave uh, ports like uh, Bristol and Liverpool and would sail down uh, around uh, Spain and down the coast of Africa to West Africa, the Gold Coast, where they would sell trinkets to African uh, war, uh, chiefs to purchase slaves and then transport slaves across the Atlantic to the Caribbean or southern United States where they would sell them again for goods that they would transport back to England. And Newton had been part of that. In fact, he had been caught up in a, in a situation where he himself had been a slave. He had been uh, gone ashore, he had been captured by a uh, a man who was running a, a kind of a slave plantation in Africa and for a while he was a slave himself you'd think that would cure him of, of the, the horrible uh, jo- uh, uh, job but it did not and in the late 1740s uh, uh, once, uh, one occasion when his ship had, had sold slaves in the Caribbean and they were heading back to England they had run into a horrific storm and Newton, who had been a godless man, cried out to God that if God got them through, then he'd think better of his life. And God got them through. And Newton started to be shocked that maybe there is a God who'd answered his prayer. And he began to read the scriptures. And he came to Liverpool <clears throat> in the late 1740s and was there, uh, became part of an evangelical c- congregation. Uh, and we used to go and hear George Whitfield preach and in time during the 1750s began to be convinced that God was calling him to pastoral ministry and so it was in the early 1760s when Newton was in his early 30s he was called to the church at a place called Olney in Buckinghamshire and he would be the minister of the church for about 18 uh, about 17 to 18 years in Olney And it's in this context that William Cooper meets him. And Newton is enjoying God's blessing in that church. Only was a town of about 3,000 people, most of them lace workers, men and women who worked in like uh, little factories in their homes where they made lace doilies and other lace products. And it was very tiresome work. They'd be up from uh, morning from uh, sunrise to sunset. And for many of them, as the, as the years went on, it, it, was a, it was a crippling sort of work because it was very fine, very delicate. And, and uh, if you didn't have your vigor and strength as you got older, it would be very difficult to, to, to maintain that occupation. But it was among these sort of people that Newton had a rich, rich ministry. And his church was filled, and probably somewhere between eight, 800 to 1,000 on a Sunday morning would listen to him preach. He wasn't the greatest of preachers but he had a powerful grasp of what God had done for him. He was a great spiritual mentor. He became a spiritual guide to many in the area. And so it was, Cooper was introduced to him, and he was perfect for Cooper. Newton, the extrovert, the man who had lived all his rough and ready life, who'd had a radical conversion. Cooper, a very delicate man, a man who'd been trained to the life of a country gentleman in England, but also who had had a radical conversion. And Newton, for a number of years, was a balm to Cooper's soul. He would take him with him on his visits, pastoral visits. He got Newton to lead in prayer sometimes in the service. On other occasions, he got Newton sometimes to take uh, prayer meetings. Historically, as some commentators who have not been Christians have looked at Cooper's life, they have argued that Newton pushed him too far. In fact, Newton was the cause of Cooper's insanity. It's completely wrong. Cooper had already had a serious breakdown 
long before he before he met um, before he met Newton. And if anything calmed Cooper's mind, it was his evangelical faith. It was his link with Newton that produced the great only hymns, about 200 hymns or more, that they, they published in a hymnal in 1779. In the late 1760s, Newton, who'd been writing hymns for quite a while, suggested to, to Cooper, you're a poet, why don't we collaborate on a hymnal? And so it was they produced the only the only hymns, the most famous of which has to be Amazing Grace, a great hymn that was based on a passage out of 1 Chronicles, interestingly enough. But we're not doing Newton, so I'm going to pass that by. Um, the hymn that was to appear in the early 1770s, it did not appear until 1779. We're going to look at four of the hymns that were in it uh, in the second hour. And the reason it didn't appear in the early 1770s was because Cooper had another relapse. There are three major periods of insanity in Cooper's life. The first one in 1763 is the one that leads to his conversion. The second one in 1773 will leave him shattered in a number of ways. And then there was a third one in the late 1780s which will stay with him on and off to the end of his life. In 1773, he had a dream. He never, t never told anyone what the dream was about, but he said this, the recollection of this dream, in, before the recollection of this dream, all consolation vanishes, and as it seems to me, must always vanish. Most scholars who studied this period of, of Cooper's life and this dream in particular felt that it was a dream in which he saw himself in hell. And he took it as a message from God. And he was plunged again into deep, deep despair. Newton helped him emerge to some degree whole from that, uh, or to emerge to some degree from this, this second bout of deep depression and almost insanity. But by the early 1780s, <clears throat> by 1780 in fact, Newton had moved away from Olney. He had gone to a ministry at a place called St. Mary Woolmouth in London where he would be till his death in 1807. And so Cooper was left with his family, with the, the people he was living with, the Unwins, in Olney. And he had lost probably his closest spiritual guide. And so it was when a third bout of depression hit him in the 1780s there was really nobody to help him spiritually the third bout was made worse by one of his cousins a man named John Johnson recommending he not stay in Olney but he go and live with him in Norfolk at a place called East Durham it was a disastrous move for Cooper he left his Norfolk is a very different kind of scenery from um, uh, Buckinghamshire where he was living Buckinghamshire is rolling hills, beautiful fields. And uh, Cooper had gotten to know many of the fields on his walks. Um, Norfolk, w the area they were living in, is known as the Fens. It's very barren. It can be very dreary and dismal. And not surprisingly, it didn't help Cooper at all. One of the greatest disappointments was, he, as I said, he had a number of hares. And he had to leave them all behind. You might think that that's nothing, but it was... It was a deep disappointment uh, to, to Cooper. He had no assurance of his salvation. None at all. And he wrestled with deep despair. And yet there were times in that period, in his last years, where he had insights, as it were, that his thinking was wrong. Now, for instance, he says this about a man who was afraid to die. This is a poem. 1792. "'Tis the judgment that shakes him. There's the fear that prompts his wish to stay alive. He has long, he has incurred a long arrear, that is, arrear of debts, and he despairs to pay. Pay! Follow Christ and all is paid. His death your peace ensures. Think on the grave where he was laid, and calm descend to yours. Uh, it's very rich. Very evangelical. There's some, there's some scholars who say the last 12 years of his life, Cooper lost all of his faith completely. He was no longer an evangelical. It's not true at all. 
Not at all true. What he's lost is his assurance most of the time about his own salvation. In 17, again in 1792, he could write to Newton, Newton living in London, and tell him of terrible, soul-killing depressions. And on one time he told him that he believed that the last shock, that is his death, will be fatal to him spiritually. In other words, that death, when it came, would find him plunged into hell. The last shock came, we're going to look at his, his hymns in the next hour, the last shock came in 1800. John Johnson was with him at the end. And he had stepped out of the room and stepped back in and Cooper had died. And he said he was amazed as he looked at the, the look on Cooper's face. Gone was the look of all torture. His face bore, he said, an expression, this is John Johnson, an expression of enraptured wonder. And Cooper often wrote about how God surprises his people. And we trust that God surprised him at the end. He never, in his last years, felt that he would be saved. And the great surprise was that as he passed over, he found he was in glory and not in hell. Well, we want to, in the next hour, look at uh, four of his hymns. Uh, ones that I'm sure uh, you know well maybe not by the titles he gave them God Moves in a Mysterious Way which is a very well known hymn uh, There is a Fountain uh, Filled with Blood uh, probably in my, my view his best hymn Lovest Thou Me which is not that well known a hymn and then a hymn uh, which uh, he entitled I Will Praise the Lord at All Times and uh, after we've looked at the hymns, uh, if we want to take some time uh, for questions. Okay, so it's uh, just past 8.30. We'll break uh, for, uh, let's say, about 10 moves in a mysterious way. But that Newton, uh, rather Cooper, uh, calls light shining out of darkness, which is based on the Gospel of John, John 1, verse 5 talking about Christ and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend or did not overcome it. God moves in a mysterious way. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err, and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. Some commentators, and I think of the great uh, student of uh, hymns, Eric Rutley, or Rutley, uh, talks of this hymn as a hymn of despair, but it's the exact opposite. It's a hymn of assurance. It's a hymn that declares, as we will see, that despite the way that the world looks, despite the, 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 the aspects of events that come into a believer's life, God is working out his sure purpose. God is working out his sovereign purpose. And God's people should take comfort and courage. God, though he moves mysteriously, will accomplish his purposes and one day will make it all plain. And so it's not a hymn of despair in any way sense of form or in any way a shape or form it's a hymn of great assurance in what God is doing he begins with a very interesting line God moves in a mysterious way God moves he acts he has plans he has purposes in human life in human society and in history but it's in, an, in a mysterious way it's in an unknowable way and to illustrate this uh, uh, Cooper shows 
takes a, an image from one of the Psalms that God plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. He is at work. He is active. He's active in human lives, in human society. He's active in history. He is at work in the lives of men and women. But it is like walking on the water. No sign is seen. It's not necessarily that one can trace his path accurately. God is at work. He is moving. But it's mysterious. One, he begins with a very straightforward statement. God moves. And then he ends with this wonderful expression. His moving, his acting is mysterious. And then he takes us from the imagery of God walking on the water. He takes us into the imagery of the mine, the, 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 the cavern where God is at work, like a, like a miner or like an architect, deep in unfathomable mines of never failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. From planting his footsteps in the sea and riding on the storm, we turn to a God who is at work in the depths of the earth, like a craftsman, like an artificer. But again, notice the brightness. Even in the depths, there is brightness. Here are the treasures that he is designing, and all the time working his sovereign will. Now what Stupor has in mind here is God's work of redemption. And I think he explains that in the third stanza. But he's not thinking of general providence as so much as God's working of redemption in the lives of his people. Ye fearful saints, and he could have been speaking to himself very well, because he wrestled with deep, deep fears much of his life. And uh, Cooper is one of those, as I said, sometimes enigmas to later Christians. Especially those Christians who have a robust sense of assurance and who don't wrestle with fears. But there are some of God's people who wrestle with fears, deep fears, that last with them for much of their lives. And Cooper is, a, I think, an illustration of, of God's work in such a person. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. He's encouraging those who are fearful, who look at the circumstances of their lives and think that God is absent or God has forgotten them. And he takes the imagery of clouds, the sea, God walking on the sea, God working hiddenly in, deep, in the depths of the earth, and now clouds, when we think of clouds, we think of rain and storms. But these clouds are not ones of judgment. They're big with mercy. And they will bring blessings on your head. God moves in a mysterious way. Blind unbelief, to jump to the last stanza, I'm going to come back to the other. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. He's thinking there, actually. Notice the little footnote. This is a footnote provided by Cooper himself. John 13, verse 7. You might know that verse. That's the one where Jesus has stooped to wash the disciples' feet. And Peter protests. No, Lord, you, uh, I don't want you to do this to me. And uh, Jesus then says, uh, uh, If you, I do not wash your feet, you have no part of me. And then he says, well, watch me holy then. You know, from one extreme, as it were, to the other. And Jesus says, well, those who have already been cleansed need only their feet to be washed. And then we read these verses. Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And so often, and, and here uh, Cooper is taking it as a par paradigm of the Christian life, so often what God does in the lives of his children we do not see the full significance of it at the time. The life of faith often is lived in hindsight as we look back and see God's hand, God's moving us. But at the time, sometimes it looks like we're walking in darkness. And blind unbelief is sure to err. If you, if you take simply what you see and feel as a guide necessarily to what God is doing in your life, you're sure to err. And thus he gives in the previous two stanzas some examples of this, of not judging the Lord's work by feeble sense. We must trust him for his grace. Often providence looks to us to be frowning. It often did to Cooper. 
One wonders if Cooper thought and meditated on this hymn that he had written in probably 1769-1770 in his later years. But it's certainly true in Cooper's own case. He felt God had abandoned him for many, 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 there were many days. He woke up and he felt only despair and fear and felt God had abandoned him. But behind the frowning providence was God's smiling face. So often we take to be God's absence and darkness. But in fact, if we hold on by faith, God will never abandon his people. And then again, the, 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 the next stanza. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. And he gives the example of the bud. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. In the original version, he didn't write the sweet will be the flower. Newton, as they collaborated together to produce a final version, uh, Newton encouraged him to change that to sweet will be the flower. But he originally it said, but wait to smell the flower. The bud may have a bitter taste, but wait to smell the flower. And he's using two of the senses. That if you take the one sense, that of eating, well, you eat a bud and most buds don't taste, taste that nice. But the other sense, the smell that it will produce. And again, that we're not to, to, we're not to live by sense. We're not to, to live on the basis of the way something appears. Big clouds, frowning providence, bittersweet buds. But God has better things in store. And so he's using these various images, these emblems, to, il to illustrate that God's work in the lives of his people is often mysterious. And I trust that that's something you real I've realized as Christians. As you walk with the Lord, he often takes his people through periods of darkness. One of the great Puritan writers, Thomas Goodwin, wrote a book called The Child of Light Walking in Darkness. He often takes his people through situations and circumstances when they have no idea what the Lord is doing in their lives. And this hymn is a great encouragement. Not to look at the external, not to look maybe at our immediate circumstances, but to look deeper and realize that if we are by faith in Christ, one day God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. His great hope Cooper envisages that day, great day, when all of the confusion, all the darkness, and all the ignorance will be dispelled in the light of heaven. One day God will make it plain. The passage that one might use to, to think through what uh, Cooper is doing in this uh, hymn is 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Would that Cooper had maybe taken his encouragement more to heart in some of his own struggles. But constitutionally, there are reasons that can be explained as to why uh, he struggled with deep depression and at times even insanity in his later years. But it's a marvelous hymn. It's a hymn of assurance a hymn of encouragement.